Yo! Welcome back to One More Mana. My name is Derek and today we are getting right back into the deck text and I'm so excited. This is one of my personal decks I've been playing for a very long time and it just so happens to go hand in hand with my favorite Christmas movie, objectively just the best Christmas movie, which we'll get into in a little bit. But before we get started, please, I know you're gonna wanna get some of these cards, I guarantee it. So when you do, please go down to the affiliate link down below. It's our affiliate link with TCG Player. Any cards you buy through there are gonna help support the channel, help us get out more and better content. We always, always appreciate it. TCG Player is awesome. You're gonna be able to find any cards, any fancy promos, any fancy foils, they're all there. Buy it through TCG Player and help us help the content. We thank you so much. So like I mentioned before, this deck is one of my personal decks that I've played for years that I absolutely love and it really does remind me of my all-time favorite Christmas movie. That movie just happens to be Gremlins. <laughs> It is just, oh, it is a perfect movie. I love it. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with the movie. I wanted a pet gremlin, and as cute and adorable as Gizmo was, I didn't want Gizmo. I wanted those psychotic, crazy mutated ones that got fed past midnight. That's what I was looking for. I wanted one of those. I'm not sure why it would probably definitely have, you know, tried to kill me and all that fun stuff, but I just thought they were crazy cool, and I wanted one. But there is no commander in Magic that just really just represents everything that those little psychotic gremlins are about better than Krenko Mob Boss. Obviously there is an actual gremlin creature type in Magic, but those don't, they're not like from the movie, I don't I, those gremlins are way too adorable. Goblins are the real gremlins in this case, and they are so crazy. They just, so much of what I love about all those little psychos from the movie, they're just chaotic, psychotic, and just trying to cause pain. And that's exactly what Krenko Mob Boss is looking to do, is trying to cause pain and cause it fast. Now anyone who's not familiar with this Krenko, it is quite possibly the strongest Goblin Commander and it is all about speed. It is trying to be explosive and it is trying to just go insane. You need a calculator when you play this deck because the number of Goblins you can get are just dumb. Okay, so if you're not familiar, Krenko's four mana, so three, three. You're not worried about that, but when you tap it, you create X11 goblins where X is the number of goblins you control. He's already a goblin himself, so automatically you get one. But this is insane. There's no mana put into this. It's literally just tap and make the goblins. So if you get tap on tap effects, you can get silly. Now, obviously, you need to give it haste because this is not, this card is scary. Anyone who's a, just an established EDH player, when it sees Krenko, you want to kill it. You do not, never, never, never let a Krenko sit around because bad things will happen. But if you're able to give it haste, you can guarantee activations, even if people try to kill it, and even if they're able to, you're still going to get what you need off of that crank up. So the name of this deck, you want to enable haste, you want to create tons of goblins, and you want to profit from the goblins entering, from the goblins being there, and from the goblins leaving. And that'll make more sense as I get through it, but this deck is built for speed, it's built to just burn people out, and it is so much fun, believe me. It, in that movie, if those gremlins could ever figure out how to play Magic, and specifically EDH, they'd all be wanting to play Krenko, because they're just one and the same. They would they would get along real, real well. So looking at the creatures, what do we care about? We care about goblins. We want goblins on goblins on goblins, because that's what Krenko cares about when Krenko taps. You need to have a lot of goblins out. It's great if you have all these effects, but you want goblins. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to put a premium on goblins that give things haste. So Goblin Bushwhacker and uh, Reckless Bushwhacker, Goblin Chief, and different cards like that that give everything haste is super important. One, for Krenko, we want to be able to activate Krenko the turn he comes out because we don't want to waste a Krenko cast. And two, if we do make a Goblin army, you know what? If we just created 30 Goblins, great. But if we can't give it haste, it's just sitting there looking pretty. Not ideal. So we want to have tons of haste enablers. Outside of these, though, there are still some all-stars that you just absolutely need if you're gonna build a Krenko, because there's lots of flexibility in which ones you want, but there's some that it's just hard not to include. The first one is a relatively new card. It is Dockside Extortionist. I just recently finally got a copy of this to put in my Krenko deck. It is just insane, especially in a deck like this that struggles so hard to ramp. Mono Red needs ramp so bad. If you play Dockside early, awesome. Even if you get just a few treasures, it gets you that little bump ahead. You don't need much of a bump ahead in mana for Krenko to go off and it's great, but even late game, you can get crazy amounts of mana that are gonna allow you to either recast Krenko or play two or three cards, setting up an explosive turn. Dockside Extortionist is insane. I've seen it in play a few times now, and it is 
I thought it was good when I saw it. It's it's even better in, in practice. It's ridiculous. These next two creatures I'm going to include together because if you run a one, you're going to run the other. And it's Goblin Recruiter and Goblin Ring Leader. These are awesome. What these two cards let you do is you play the Goblin Recruiter. It lets you go pick out goblins and you basically layer your deck to where you put four goblins you want, throw the Goblin Ring Leader on top of it. Next turn you get to play the Ring Leader and then just get the other four goblins into your hand. It is a weird, indirect way to draw cards, essentially, in this mono-red deck. It's a super powerful combination of cards. If you're running goblins, you want these two, because it lets you not only tutor for the exact goblins you need, but get them into your hand that next turn. Super powerful. The next creature we're going to look at is Skirk Prospector. This card is ridiculous. There's a number of cards we have in here that care about goblins either leaving the battlefield or dying, so having sack outlets is ridiculous. Also, to make sure your commander never gets stolen, because that would not be good in this deck. So, Skirk Prospector is awesome. It also gets to the point where some of those turns where you can make 20 or 30 goblins, all of a sudden you get access to so much mana and you can just start sacking stuff, casting more things, cycling through cards. Skirt, there's a lot of good sack outlets. Skirk Prospector is one of the better ones. And one of the goblins in the deck that I end up tutoring for so often whenever I'm looking for a specific goblin is going to be Pashalik Mons. Pashalik Mons is relatively new and it has been insane since I've been able to put it in the deck. So whenever it or another goblin dies, you deal one damage to any target. This is one of those payoffs that you can get to where if you can get a board of 30, 40, 50, easily more than that goblins, you just have way too many goblins. Even if they have a propaganda, sack everything, deal a bunch of damage. If you don't have enough to kill them, swing with everything, do a whole bunch of damage, then sack everything and do even more damage. Pashalik Mons is great because it itself is a goblin. You get those death triggers from other goblins. It allows you to create more goblins with Krenko. It's just so powerful. And we had that effect with other cards in the past, but being able to have it on a goblin is just great. Now, the two most powerful non-goblins that I do want to mention, one is going to be Ogre Battle Driver. This is a must-have in the deck. When stuff enters, it gets haste and it gets buffed. So this is going to have that twofold effect of great automatic commander activation, but also on those turns where you're going off, you make 30 goblins, all of a sudden, they're all getting buffed. And one ones, a lot of one ones can do some damage, but when there are three ones, that makes it so much more dangerous in addition to the fact they have haste. Anyone who's played against a locust god knows tokens with haste are not okay. Things get way too scary, way too fast. And with the explosiveness of Krenko being able to just give that universal haste and a buff, it's just ridiculous. And the last creature, we might have just be a saving for a little special step at the end of the video. Looking at the enchantments, Ashland's Prerogative is a must-run to me. I used to kind of cycle out a number of different haste enablers, but this one's just so good because the thing is, Krenko's even and your tokens are even. So essentially what this is going to do is cause a whole bunch of stuff to enter tapped for you and your opponents. But all the stuff that really matters, your Krenko and all those tokens entering untapped with haste. This is going to enable you to have a level of explosiveness and stop blockers from having as good of a chance to be able to do so. It's super, super powerful. It has a weird, almost like Void Winnower type effect for blockers to start off. And it is just, for two mana, does a great job of setting you up. Now, I am running a very mean card in this deck. I am running Blood Moon, so I know it's going to, you know, get some strange reactions so people really don't like Blood Moon. Don't blame the people. It can be kind of an annoying card. But in a deck like this, it's the only deck where I feel like I've played that I feel like I need it. <laughs> it's one of those cards that, because Krenko is so vulnerable to removal, if you're playing against a very high-powered deck that has lots of removal and is just a very fast deck, it can just kill Krenko and just outrace you. And if you're playing against lower power decks that are playing possibly more basics, then Blood Moon is not going to matter against them. I, the games I've played Blood Moon has done a phenomenal job of being able to slow opponents down just enough to let Krenko maybe stick around for that one extra turn and get things going. Because especially in higher powered metas, playing Krenko, he's just going to be a removal magnet. And any little things you can do to kind of slow people down a little bit, I'm not usually a fan of that play style, but with Krenko, I found it to be necessary to keep him out there. And kind of along those same lines, I love Price of Glory. Price of Glory is phenomenal because basically it's going to have a similar effect because you, you want to stop people from doing more things than you're able to do. Essentially, you want to keep your mono red. You want to try to get people on that level playing field. And if they're just casting instants whenever they feel like it, doing stuff on your end step, doing stuff in response, you're not going to, you don't run counter spells. You're not running that type of stuff. You're not going to be in a great position to deal with it. But if you play Price of Glory, because you're really only spending mana on your own turn, 
I think there's one instant in the deck. This is amazing. It's going to get everybody playing at sorcery speed. Now, obviously, you can go with going to the Falcon, or if you want, you just also have instant speed stuff. But this is great because if you get to your turn, on the instant before your turn, you activate that Krenko, and all of a sudden you start going off, it makes it really hard for people to respond if they need to sacrifice lands in order to do so. I mean, people are hesitant if there's a boring clex and their lands aren't going to untap. Imagine if they need to destroy those lands that's happened. It really can slow people down and allow your strategies to get moving without having to worry about as much interference. And then obviously we're in the enchantments. We're running the typical Bogart shenanigans and, and Goblin Bombardment. But I really, those cards, you know why they're there. They're obviously includes I kind of want to touch on some of the other stuff that I did throw in there as well. Now looking at the sorceries, one thing that I do love to have in this deck are the sorcery speed goblin creators. So that's stuff like Krenko's Command, Hordling Outburst, and Goblin War Party is a new one from Modern Horizons that I love too. These are just great ways to, if your board gets wiped, if you have to reset for any reason, to get two, three goblins out and just get them thrown out on the board to reset. Because it's really hard if you have Krenko and Crank on one goblin. The amount of turns you need to tap and untap and get all these goblins out, it's really difficult to be able to build up a board and become an intimidating presence again. But when you can just spend three mana for three goblins, it's super efficient and it's just great to rebuild the board. Not to mention Goblin War Party has the plus of being able to buff things and give haste. Goblin War Party is awesome. It's probably my favorite because of that versatility, but all three of them I love running these types of cards. When I first ran Cranko, I didn't, so I was like, why not just run a regular Goblin because you're gonna get more utility from it. But just the efficiency of two, three mana for two or three Goblins is phenomenal. I kind of teased it before, there's literally only one instant. I'm just running Chaos Warp. Pyroblast is something I've cut and put back in and cut and put back in for obviously very situational. It, it may be meta dependent. If there's a lot of blue decks, you can put it in. But in the instant slot, the only must include for me is Chaos Warp. It's just too good of a card not to include. And it's the type of removal you're going to need in Mono Red. With the artifacts, the most important ones to me are the untappy effects. You got Thousand Year Elixir, Mage Ride Stone, and Thornbite Staff. These are examples of cards that can just let you go off. Because the thing is, Krenko increases your goblins exponentially. And to be able to tap untap two activations, it goes from... Uh, there's some goblins to, oh my gosh, there's lots of goblins. It happens so fast. Not to mention Thousand Year Elixir lets him tap with haste, and Thornbite Staff in certain situations essentially just goes infinite. With Thornbite Staff and a sack outlet, you really just make as many goblins as you want. And if you have any of those ETV triggers, death triggers, or any haste enablers, that's it's basically just going to be game. And then other than that, we're running lots of cheap mana rocks. Whatever we can get specifically we want mana rocks, we can drop. Preferably on turn two. Two, uh, two drop mana rocks are amazing in this deck where they have to tap or not, just because then that means for a turn three Krenko, which is great. And the last artifact I will talk about right now is probably the most powerful card in the deck, and it's that way in a lot of decks, and it's Skull Clamp. Skull Clamp is, in this deck, is ridiculous. You have so such easy access to goblins, and the fact that with Krenko you can bank them without spending mana means you can tap, make a bunch of goblins, use that mana to clamp the goblins, and just draw up to hand size. This deck can have trouble drawing cards. I've had to find card draw creative ways in this deck, but the games where you get Skull Clamp, even if only for a turn or two, card advantage is not a problem. You can end up just drawing up so many cards in hand, you really don't have to worry about it anymore. Literally two turns of a Skull Clamp can fix you for the whole game. That's how powerful it is. And it's, it's, it's so many decks. If you play it in a token deck, you know how it is. It's crazy strong, and especially in a deck that struggles with card draw, you need it in there. Looking at the lands, you notice this is the lowest land count I have in any deck that I play. It's 36 lands, and that stresses me out just thinking about how low the land count is. Fortunately, our average CMC is like 2.4, 2.5. It's crazy low, so nothing in our deck. I think the highest thing on Kurt is a 5-drop by far. Like, everything's like 1, 2, 3. Such low curve in this deck that 36 lands has been enough to get me by. Even then, it's still kind of stressing me out, but yeah, 36 lands is enough. We are going to be running, really the two most important lands to me are going to be Flamekin Village and Handwire Battlements because they themselves are haste enablers. It's great to go ahead and use that for Cranko. If you have a Hall of Bandit Lord, throw that in there too. Now you may notice I'm not running snow-covered lands in this deck. Our snow-covered mountains are super common in Cranko decks and in just monocolored decks in general, especially because they just reprinted them. Uh, for a long time, I actually did have snow-covered mountains. I also had scrying sheets and extra planar lens in there, but I ended up cutting them for a couple reasons. 
One isolated watchtower kind of just does what scrying sheets does, but a little bit better. So I, I didn't need two slots for that, especially in a deck that has as many red mana symbols. I didn't want to have all the extra colorless lands. So that was part of it. But the other part was that every time I played extra planar lands, it felt like it was immediately removed. And in a deck that struggles to get the lands out, if I only had three or four lands and I played extra planar lands and exiled a land under it, and someone just blew it up, all of a sudden I'm down a land. Now maybe in mono green, that's a great thing because you have so many lands you have access to, it's just free mana doubler and it's cheap to do. In mono red, I just found in so many situations, I was hesitant and almost scared to even play extra planar lands because all I, I'm going to lose a land and someone's just going to blow it up. And even then, you have, all your stuff is so low to the ground. It's all one, twos, and three drops that even when it stuck around, that mana doubling, other than just trying to recast Krenko, didn't make a big difference. So I just found that risk wasn't worth it. I ended up slotting some other cards in place of it. But obviously, if you've had good experience with extra playing lands in your snow-covered mountains, go ahead and do that. This is the perfect deck to run that in. It's just, in my experience, I wasn't having much luck with it, and I decided to try some other stuff in those slots. But yes, now we are on to the most exciting part, the most fun part, and in this deck, the most explosive part, and it's the game-winning step. How are we about to win the game in this deck? Now, the number three way that I have to win the game in this deck is Throne of the God Pharaoh. Throne of the God Pharaoh is a ridiculous card. It's one of those cards that in a lot of decks, over the course of the game, can do enough damage to kill people, but in Krenko, it can just happen in one turn. The way I like to use this card is it's really, again, not hard to get 20 or 30 goblins on the table. And if you just swing with everything, at that point, you're not even worried about how much damage you get through because at the end of the turn, throwing the God Pharaoh is about to just wreck people for all that damage. It is tremendous at getting around different Glacial Chasm type effects. It's tremendous at getting around different propaganda type effects. It is super powerful. And for only two mana, you can just sneak it in before the end of your turn and just do work. Now, the number two way to win the game in this deck is a card I did you know, skip over earlier, and it's one that if you saw the deck list, you knew it was coming, it's Perforos. Perforos is a game-winning card in just about any deck it's in. Perforos is ridiculous. Two damage per goblin entering is just dumb. You literally only need 20 goblins to enter to kill everyone at their starting life total. Anyone who's played Krenko knows 20 is, you're just getting warmed up when you're making 20 goblins. That is nothing. So Perforos is ridiculous, and it's just, it's indestructible. You can't, it's probably the best way to win the game, to be honest. It's probably the most efficient because it is so hard to get rid of. And if Perforos is on the table for more than a turn or two with Krenko, yeah, then that's game over. That's just going to end it right there. And because I just love comically large numbers and really just overkill when it comes to attacking with way more damage than you need to, my number one way to win the game is one of these two cards or a combination of the two in that shared animosity <laughs> and coat of arms. Now, if you get these out together... Everyone needs to watch out. You, I can't, you, even a calculator won't be able to keep up with how much damage you're about to do with all these little goblins. But Coat of Arms, all creatures get plus one, plus one for each other creature that shares a creature type with it. And with Shared Animosity, it's almost the same effect, except they get plus one, plus O oh for others that are attacking with the same creature type. Now, Shared Animosity is just for your stuff. Coat of Arms is universal, but unless someone else is playing goblins, I don't even care if they're playing tribal. They're not going to be able to keep up. Like I've talked about throughout this video, 10, 20... Goblins, that's nothing. Now, all of a sudden, you give them all plus 20 plus 20. That's something. <laughs> that gets crazy. And if at any point you happen to get them both out, I, I, I'm not even going to pretend to try to do the math. Yeah, everyone's just dead. You don't even need to worry about it. There's no assigning blockers. There's nothing. It's just over. I love big, flashy, dumb stuff. And Magic, you guys know that. You know how much. That's, that's what I love to do with any deck I build. <laughs> to be able to swing with a bunch of... 100, 100, or 200, whatever they are, goblins, and just swing at people's face with it. It feels good, and it is so much fun, and that's why that is the number one way to win the game in this deck for me. That's going to do it for this week's Deck Tech. I really, really hope y'all enjoyed it. Any experienced crank up players, please make some suggestions. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. It is a super fun and crazy deck. I will be back very soon with more Deck Techs, you know, reminding me of my favorite holiday movies. I feel like the Gremlins is a perfect place to start seeing this how it is, you know, already the best movie, but we'll find some other good movies that uh, will get us into the holiday spirit also. So keep an eye out for those. It's about to be crazy. Gameplay is either already here, about to be here, one of the two. Either way, watch it. If it's not out yet, get ready for it because it is crazy and it is a super fun game. So much happening. So excited to see what y'all think. But until then, I will see you guys next time.